we can't promise somebody that they can become famous or whatever, but certainly they should have a right to at least be there side by side with the biggest acts of all time. We can ensure that you're there too. Where that takes you, that we can't promise, but a simple promise of if you make music, you have the right to release it and let people hear it. Hi, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast, where we interview cutting-edge creative artists, entrepreneurs, and innovators who are changing the world. We also bring you tips and techniques that you can implement. This episode is brought to you by my favorite productivity hack, the Brain FM app, this podcast's hosts, Podbean, as well as my book, Speak From Within. And for a limited time, for my podcast listeners, I'm offering a complimentary 15-minute coaching session. See the link at azoldat.com slash coaching or take a look in the show notes. Hey there, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super grateful that you took the time to be here. I'm also really excited and grateful to have this week's guest on the show. You're going to love Scott. Check this out. Scott Cohen joined Jukebox. Now, it's pronounced Jukebox, but it's spelled J-K-B-X, in 2022 as founding chief executive officer and investor. One of the music industry's most notable pioneers, Cohen co-founded The Orchard. You might remember this if you're close to my age. This was the world's first digital distributor of music. Established in 1997, The Orchard, now owned by Sony Music, gave independent artists and labels a platform to sell their music to mainstream audiences and has since become the leading distribution company with 45 offices worldwide. Cohen retired from The Orchard in 2019 and joined Warner Music Group as its first ever chief innovation officer. You know how much I love that. That's a role uniquely tailored to Cohen's expertise. Not only is Scott a proponent of new technology and innovation in the industry, he also carries this through his personal life. He's a cyborg human rights activist and has been a vegan for the past 25 years. You know how much that rings my bell. Scott, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Welcome. Well, thanks. Uh, great to be here and great to know that you're also a fellow vegan. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> and we've got a lot of vegans who listen to the show, so they're all they're all sort of doing the little butt wiggle dance in their seats if they're listening. Uh, so I'm I'm really there are so many touch points. You and I were chatting right before we started recording. There are so many things we already have in common. We both we both found out we love the Baltic states. We found out, of course, that we're both vegan. I wanted to sort of check in with you, though, and go. You had a pretty circuitous but also really almost enviable journey in the music industry and embracing technology. I would love it if you would just just run through a little bit about how you went from founding Orchard to now being with Jukebox and really what is your principal guiding effort in in the work that you're doing? Wow. That, 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 that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I don't and, ask small ones. <laughs> yeah, that, it's a big question. And, and even a, 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 a big statement of a envious, you know, journey or path. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, it, it, you know, it always looks so, so nice on paper, but the path <laughs> while you're, while you're on the journey is, is, can also be quite challenging. You know, I think back to, you know, I started the orchard with my 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 business partner Richard Goderer back in the mid '90s, and I don't I don't know if anyone knows what the orchard is. It was a it it is a a, a music distribution company that supplies like Spotify and all the places people go to consume music. It, mm -hmm. It's it's big, but when we started it, it was the mid '90s, and we had envisioned you know a place where you know on the, on this new technology of the of the world wide web aol you know dial up modems of how you got online where there was no photos videos or music mm -hmm. we envisioned a world where people would both create and consume music digitally which seems so obvious to us but obviously it wasn't <laughs> obvious to anyone else and it was quite a challenging period in those early, early days of, of developing something. Um, and, and so, so what sounded envious, um, you know, to some people like, oh, you were in early and did all of that. Yeah. It also meant we didn't make any money because, you know, who was downloading music and paying for it in the nineties, you know, we, you know, Napster, 
the illegal service wasn't even until June of 1999. Like we were way before that, hmm. um, which meant it was a truly challenging journey, meaning, how do I put it? <laughs> because we were building this company um, in a space that didn't exist yet. Like, you know, if I said, oh, I'm selling hotels, rooms on, you know, reservations on the moon, you go, yeah, but nobody's built a hotel on the moon yet. So you're a little early. So we were selling something before it existed, mm. um, meant that we got very deep in debt because, because the idea was so that seems so obvious now was so audacious back then. We also didn't attract any investment. So we had to bootstrap the company from day one. And what ultimately happened was um, I got very, very poor. Mm. Um, at, at one point, probably in, in, in the darkest part, um, I was uh, lost my home and my car and all my possessions. I was three million dollars in debt wow when i say in debt it's it, we didn't have funding it's literally i owed everybody money um i i i owed you know every artist uh i owed our landlord and our you know to pay the electric bill we owed the irs and even though i said i owed the irs money they they used different terminology they would say you do you don't owe us money it's called tax evasion or tax fraud, and you can go mm. to prison for twenty years. So, so it was it was really a challenging period. Just you know, we ultimately succeeded, and every single bill that we ever owed was paid off, and that was one of the highlights of my life to be able to to pay off three million dollars of debt, including the old IRS bills. Um, uh, we grew that company quite significantly over the years then and 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 it grew to be you know as the first the first digital distributor so then when iTunes launched in 2003 we were sitting on the largest catalog of digital rights in the world like we were a third of the iTunes music store wow. because even though that you know you can imagine the big labels owned all these rights to the to the biggest acts in the world they didn't have the right to exploit that because they mm. hadn't negotiated the digital rights with them where we've been doing this for, you know, years, you know, since the mid nineties, all the way up until iTunes launch of that, I guess that was April of 2003. Um, the company then continued to grow when I exited in 2019, when I retired, I think we were doing about a billion dollars in revenue and, accounted for something like 20% of Sony Music's uh, <laughs> recorded music revenue. So it got pretty big. Uh, sorry, that was a, the only reason I went into that detail is because you said, oh, it sounds so amazing and it's an envious position, but it's a shit position to be in when you have no money. And, and that actually, when I was $3 million in debt, that also meant I was homeless, um, mm. sleeping on the floor in the office. So challenging times. Um, but popped out the other end. Sorry, that was a, a super long answer, but you asked a big question. No, 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 no. There are no wrong answers and there are no long answers here. This is great. <laughs> so, so I, first of all, wow, that's an amazing story. And second of all, I, I would love to talk to you a little bit about your mindset right when you're in that place you're obviously you have an entrepreneurial mindset i can tell that that you you were willing yeah. to bootstrap you were willing to be homeless you were willing you weren't playing it safe no so so talk to me about your mindset in those in those dark times what kept you going how did you persevere in times where things looked really quite bleak yeah i i, I think there's a few ways i, I looked at it you know um, one is, you know, the normal stuff about having grit, you know, like sticking with it. You know, when, when you hear any kind of founder story, they never say, oh, I came up with an idea and then everything fell into place and then people loved me and I made a <laughs> lot of money and then things got even better. Like, like that's just not a story, whether it's a story of a of a of a startup or it's a story of a band like 
that's never that that perfect line of of from starting point through being wealthy, successful, and happy. That's just not how it works. Um, so there was certainly a lot of grit to power through because maybe it's a bit of arrogance in me, but I just knew I was right. Like I just knew that this was going to be the world that people would be consuming and creating digitally. They'd be doing it on their phones. And by the way, when I told people they'd be doing it on their phones in the 90s, they're still thinking like, you know, oh, you go into the kitchen and you pick up the phone that has a cord on it. And like <laughs> what some somebody rings you and you're going to listen to a music or how would you create like, no, there's going to be these new mobile devices like you have to imagine this is a decade before even the first smartphone, let alone the iPhone. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was right about that. Richard and I had our, our convictions. And so that helps when, when you're just certain of, of the outcome. Uh, I was less certain about the timeline. Probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have done it if, if, if I understood the timeline. Um, the other thing is, as, as any founder will, will, will of any startup or even any musician will tell you, you know, you, you have a certain risk tolerance that you're willing to risk things, you know, and I, I even have a, a, you know, kind of thoughts on, on risk, you know, because as I've gotten older, uh, I'm 58 now. So as I've gotten older, I don't know, I started to notice something. It, I don't, I don't know. It, maybe it was in my fifties. I started looking around and, and, you know, I'm sure you got the same advice that I got, you know, this parental advice of conventional wisdom that, you know, you have, you can play it safe or you can take risks, you know, you can play it safe, get a good education, go to college, maybe get your master's, get a good job at a solid company, or you can take lots of risks. You can be a musician or a designer or start up a company, and that's so risky. But as I got older, I started to see all of my friends, not some of them, most of my friends that took the conventional wisdom of the safe path, as they got into their 40s and 50s, they were actually kind of scared because they were, some of them were getting laid off and they're like, oh, I'm the vice president of this or the regional director of that, or I head up the whole department on something like this. And then they get laid off in their forties and fifties. They're almost impossible for them to ever get hired again. Mm. That, that what they thought was, was so safe all of a sudden becomes a big risk. Like who wants to hire a 55 year old man? Like, no, I can hire a bunch of young kids that are digital savvy and and cost half the pr price or or less than 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 you and 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 this poor middle-aged person is you know still 10 or 20 years away from collecting their retirement they have a mortgage and kids in college and all of that's happening and then i looked at my friends the other set of friends that took the risky path and that path meant they were musicians and designers and startups. And I look at them as they went into their 40s and 50s, and they're actually doing really well. Okay, maybe their first band didn't take off and they became huge, but now, oh, I just wrote the score for a new film or oh, on this Netflix series, I have two songs in, in there or some designer like, okay, you struggled when you were in your 20s and 30s, but now you're doing designs for a big hotel chain and like, all of the people that took the risk started doing better. And then I started thinking, maybe the riskiest thing you could ever do is play it safe. Mm. And the safest thing you could ever do is start to take risks. Um, and that really refamed me. I, I, I didn't have that kind of uh, perspective when I, when I started you know, at the orchard, but I certainly have that perspective now. And so, even as I'm at a certain age, I'm still taking risks. I'm still not playing it safe. Like playing it safe would have been stay at the orchard. I, I walked away. I didn't have to leave. I walked away. So, yeah, I, again, I think I'm keep going on tangents with you. I think that's great. As I said, that's exactly mm -hmm. what the show's about is, is that's to me, that stream of consciousness, that 
oh, I know what I'm going to do, or oh, I know what I'm going to say. That's the juice and the sizzle. That's yeah. what that's what I love because, frankly, in in this notion of playing safe versus taking those risks, in some ways, when you take those risks, you're being more true to who you really are, and yeah. so. To me, hearing you say that and, and to, to hear that it's being borne out by your friends who are a little bit older and who are now facing these big questions of what's the, what's the next phase of my life going to be like, that knowing that, hey, if I took those risks in my 20s and 30s, yeah. that now means something different. Like for me personally, I worked at NASA for many years and left there to go do music full time. And I had to go through this transition, right? The I'm working full time at NASA, which admittedly was amazing, fun work mm -hmm. and doing music full time. So I was I didn't sleep very much. But in those moments when I was working 100 to 120 hours a week, I had I had these little daily epiphanies of I love what I'm doing and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. So for you, when you're you're settled at Orchard, it's 2019 and you go, you know what? I I don't I don't have to leave, but something's pushing me on. Yeah. And and you moved and you move forward. Can you talk to me a little bit about how how you reached that decision and how Jukebox became the thing you went to? Well, it wasn't. There was an interim step in there. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because once I had accomplished everything I wanted at Orchard, if, if anything, I was there maybe a little longer than I needed to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I said to my business partner, like, Richard, I think I'm just ready to retire. I think I'm done. You know, like, what more do I, I, I have nothing to prove. We've accomplished everything we need to. Like, come on, man, I, I think I'm out. And he's like, I don't blame you. I think it's a good idea. He said, and, mm. and he gave me some really great advice. He said, okay, if you're going to leave, and I totally understand it, um, before you leave, you know, you want to kind of have your next thing set up. Mm. You know, you don't want to just like walk out and then like, what, you're just going to figure out what's next? Like, start spending some time thinking about what's next before you jump. And I thought, that is great advice. And then I ignored it. <laughs> and the next day I said, Richard, I heard your advice. It was great advice, but you know what? I'm out. And, and, I, <laughs> and, and I, I put in my, you know, so-called resignation, you know, as, as, a, as a founder, it's a weird thing to resign from, from your own company. Right. But I told them that um, I'm ready to resign. And I, I don't even, you know, I, I think they were like, okay, so you'll, you'll spend 2019 as a victory lap year. We'll do all this stuff. And then, you know, I'm like, oh no, I meant I'm ready to quit today. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they were like, what? And they're like, uh, I was like, all right, how about I'll go to the end of the month, you know, to fe so this was in January. This is like the second week of January. Right. And then, uh, and then I, so I gave him a few weeks on um, February 1st, I was retiring. But in that interim, I started talking to the CEO of, of Warner Music after I put in my notice. And I don't know, we just got talking and I thought, and I don't know, February 1st, which is a Friday, I retired from the orchard. And then that Monday, I guess that would have been February 4th, I was sitting in the Warner Music Group as a newly created post of the chief innovation officer, um, which, That's awesome. which was <laughs> crazy. Like now from startup world, I'm into this big organization, this multinational corporation, one of the three major labels. Um, and, and, and I think I took that because that was a challenge. You know, I knew how to take something from, you know, zero to a hundred, but how do you, what do you do when you come into a large organization? Um, I, w I was very interested in, you know, how do you bring new ideas and transform it? How do you look not just out to the horizon? How do you look over the horizon? What's mm. what, you know, it's, it's, you, you can see what's next, you know, on the horizon, but what's over that you can't see. Um, so that was my next role. And I, and I, and I, and I was certain that that was going to be my last role. Um, and I stayed there for three and a half years and did the same thing where I realized I've done what I can do. Uh, maybe it's time to, to exit. And that's when I, when I entered this new role as the founding CEO of Jukebox. Um, 
Uh, maybe maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw one more piece out there, um, because as you as 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 people listen to you know how people's careers are and startups, um, the one thing that that hopefully is a is a thread in 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 at least my career is that nothing I'm doing is disruptive. I don't believe in disruptive technologies. I think people have tried to make it cool and trendy, like, oh, I'm disrupting. Like, I don't find disruption that 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 interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I look at things that are transformational, that are additive, that says, this is what's happening now. Like, like even if I think about the orchard, we didn't disrupt anyone. We just recognized that there was this new way that people could could essentially monetize music. Mm -hmm. And I was certain that the major labels would be into it, but what about the independents? So how could we open some doors for some new people? So we weren't elbowing anyone out. We weren't disrupting anybody. We were trying to say, we can make the music industry bigger than it is. We we have a whole new, you know, blue ocean to play with and we'll go out in that way. And so that's my point. It's about, I'm not so big in disruption, but more transformational ideas, ideas that are additive, that build. I'm not trying to replace anyone. Well, to me, in, in listening to what you just said, I'm thinking expanding, right? I'm not thinking yeah. removing what's there, but expanding onto what's there. But I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of respectfully disagree with something you said. In, in in a way, I think that is disruptive because lots of people who are in power in whatever industry we're talking about, they kind of have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, right? If you're the one who's got it's sometimes a little bit difficult for you to go, oh, and there's plenty for everyone, let me share. And so so and we've see we see it borne out time and time again in various industries and politics, but we don't, we don't need to talk about all of that stuff. But that mindset that you're talking about of, hey, let's let's invite more people to the party, that isn't always one we see in business. So I kind of I kind of go, yeah, I think it is disruptive, even even if your intention is to be inclusive and expansive, you were changing the status quo being being able to as an independent musician myself, being able to go, I want to get my music out to a bunch of years. I don't want it to be just my friends sitting at the coffee shop listening to me. I want to be able to be out there. And my my biggest seller actually is in Australia. So, so you know, which would have never happened without the technology and sort of the, the, the I'm going to say fight. I'm going to say it, even though you may not think so. But the fight, the fight you fought in the 90s made it so that people like me who aren't signed with a major label could get our music out to people all over the world. Well, well I mean, I agree and disagree. I mean, because then we get into <laughs> semantics. I will, I will, um, I will also, you know, without it coming across as, you know, I, I don't want to come across as like, I don't know, any kind of tooting my own horn or arrogance. But the truth is, before the orchard, if you were a musician and you made music, there was, and you weren't signed, there was no way to release it in the world. Exactly. In any meaningful way, in any meaning. And so we really thought, well, that doesn't, we, we can't make, we can't promise somebody that they can become famous or whatever, but certainly they should have a right to, to at least be there side by side with the biggest acts of all time. We can ensure that you're there too. Um, where that takes you, that's, that that we can't promise but a simple promise of if you make music you have the right to to release it and let people hear it and that that i think was our big transformational um piece you call it disruptive i don't know i call it <laughs> and i love that you say that and and absolutely to me you're adding to the status quo but by the nature of adding to it you're changing it which is a disruption but we don't all right we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna always disagree about it which is totally fine yeah but 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 yeah it's it's you know the, if you want to call it disruption rather than transformation but but again it was it was 
creating opportunities for more people to participate in something. You know, it's it's kind of what I'm doing with the new company jukebox. You know, it's rather than disrupting anyway, I'm I'm trying to open the pathway for more people to get involved. And I love that you say that. And yeah, I don't want to I don't want to talk about the semantics of whatever disruption, addition, transformation. I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big proponent of transformation, too. If you knew me any better than this conversation, you would go, oh, yeah, she is. So but uh, the, the thing is, for me, listening to you talk about jukebox, and I would like to get into that because we could talk about all this esoteric stuff. I have a feeling I could keep you on here for six hours and we would <laughs> still not tire of talking to each other. But I, okay, so jukebox is, it is different. It is a way of providing sort of a method to reshape potentially the economy of the music industry. And, and I, and I love it and I don't quite understand it, but I would love it if you would talk a little bit about, we've talked about your journey from Orchard Warner brothers, and now you're here and there have been other, obviously other tributaries along the river of your, of your journey, but talk to me about you, you went, okay, now I'm at jukebox and now I want to transform this facet of the music industry, not access necessarily to independent musicians who are putting their music out, but a different way of looking at monetizing and the economy of the music industry. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what it is that you're trying to do with Jukebox? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure everybody listening has 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 read those headlines about somebody selling their catalog, like Bruce Springsteen or or Justin Bieber, or even Taylor Swift, that somebody bought her catalog and it wasn't her and all of these things. And we've read about all these transactions, but we don't ever get to participate in those. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, it's great that, you know, some of these big companies own these catalogs, but wouldn't it be amazing if the very people that got these artists to the place that they're at the, the fans and the, the the people that consumed it actually could share in the wealth. Mm. And so so the, the idea of Jukebox is, is fairly simple on one level. We work with rights holders. So rights holders that 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 have the copyrights that that have these catalogs. And and we have and when I say we, there, there's a jukebox as a platform, and then there's issuing companies underneath it. I, I, I should probably say this. The other thing, it's, it's, it's super important. It's crazy. But I should probably read a small statement that nothing I'm about to say should be viewed as investment advice or an offer for a, or a solicitation of interest in any securities offering meaning I am not a licensed broker. I am not giving anyone advice. I'm not suggesting you do anything or buy anything um, because we're in a fully regulated industry. So so we work with these rights holders. Sorry for the disclaimer, but- No, 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 I, I absolutely, I go for it. So, so, so we work with rights holders and you could imagine they have rights to hit songs and catalogs of music that, that make a lot of money. We know that. And what we do is we we say, let's take a portion of the income from those songs. So you keep the copyrights, but let's take a portion of the income from the song. An issuer company then takes that revenue. Um, we bring it to the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, to get qualified. And when it comes back, we have transformed income streams from music to regulated securities. So imagine that somebody could buy, you know, 10 shares of Microsoft, that's a security, and 10 shares of Apple, but also 100 shares of, of their favorite song. Because one thing is certain, music has value, songs make money. When, 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 when a song is played, somebody's getting paid, so might as well be you. Why shouldn't you be participating in it? I mean, if you look at the music industry as far back as you want, I don't care. You want to talk about, you know, I don't know, Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley. Well, the songs they sang still make money today. You know, 
the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Madonna, Michael Jackson still make money. Songs always make money and they continue to make money. And I say the word always, probably the SEC and the regulators wouldn't like the word always. But, you know, we, we know that music makes money. And once something's a hit, it seems to continue to keep generating revenue. So what we allow is the, 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 the general public who doesn't have a chance to buy into Justin Bieber's catalog because, you know, in order to buy it, there was one share and that one share cost $200 million. We've broken it down and said, well, wait a minute. What if we had we broke that down into smaller shares? So if you wanted to buy a share for ten or twenty dollars, you could actually have a piece of that. And that that that's what we do. So so what what's interesting about it again, and what's not disruptive about it is we're not trying to to disrupt the rights holder. They're still the rights holder. They're still in place. We're we're not getting rid of the people that have the copyrights. In fact. By them selling a piece of it, they're making money. We're not trying to disrupt, uh, I don't know, we're not trying to disrupt the songwriters or the recording artists. In fact, we've even created what we call our creator program. So they actually make money because you have to imagine the fact that we're selling shares in these songs is because they sold them. They don't own those rights. So we don't have to, we don't have a royalty obligation to them. We're not playing music. We don't have a contractual obligation, but we're taking our own money and creating a, a large pool that they get to share. And so we're not disrupting the artists and the, and the songwriters. And then when we're looking at, you know, the financial institutions, we're not trying to remove, you know, large institutions like NASDAQ or Fidelity. We're working with the financial world to say, how do we make the music as an asset class something that's normalized that people can trade in? And we're certainly not uh, disrupting the fans or the general public, which are called retail investors on Wall Street, hmm. um, because we're actually bringing them into that. We're providing them with an asset class that probably is the first time they've invested in something that they actually understand. Because maybe they buy shares in Apple or maybe they buy shares in Microsoft, but they, they actually understand what's driving the tech stocks. <laughs> Do they know why is why is Apple trading higher or lower or what's going on? Or, you know, oh, there was a, a strike in a mine in Africa. And that because of that, there's a material that goes into chips that are manufactured in Taiwan that goes into the iPhone from China, which means they're going to be delayed and not hit their numbers. And therefore, the Apple stock went in a different direction. Like, who knows that? But if I put a, a hit song in front of you, you go, oh, yeah, I know that song. And I know why it's big and why it's successful. And I can even make a prediction of where it's going to go in the future. Like you actually understand fundamentally the value of music. So that I find really interesting. So once again, every participant can win in this scenario and nobody is losing. Because I think it's great that we start to invite the general public into the music as an asset class instead of reserving it to large multinational corporations and and the you know super wealthy uh you know funds uh, venture capitalists and and private equity funds i'm pausing because i'm taking all of that in <laughs> i know i i should have said it in a more concise no way no no I'll... not at all not at all that's not what i mean i i embrace the pause in this show i feel like we often go, oh, I should say something right now. And I'm like, no, let's take a second and, and sort of let all of that information wash into us and through us so that we can, you know, understand it. Because it, what you're talking about, uh, I, I, again, as a musician, I'm going, yay, as someone who is looking at how the intricacies of all that stuff work. My, my brain is a little, <laughs> my mind is blown. Um, Something, something that I, I'm curious about so much of what you're talking about. The thing that I'm, I, what, <laughs> so multinational corporations, you're saying, who, who, who owns, I, I see, this is the thing. This is what's confusing me. The copyright holder 
keeps their rights. Great. Their IP is theirs. So how, who, if I, once this works, once this is, let's say I'm, I'm ready to go and I, I want to be an investor in Miley Cyrus's latest song or whatever, um, choosing her at random because she popped into my head from the Grammys the other night. So let me, let me ask you, like, I want to, uh, what is it called? Flowers, I think is her song. Flowers, her big, yep. Yeah. So, so I want to invest in flowers. Right. What is the mechanism for me to do that? And how does whoever, whoever I'm buying from a know that and B, how did that, how does that get released? Are you saying that jukebox will break apart into tiny, teeny, tiny little pieces of shares of, of a song so that different investors who are music lovers or, or investors in general can buy those share how will how does the mechanism all that work sure so 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 th- these are great questions um let, let, let let's 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 back out a step for people that don't understand the music industry and don't uh, and and don't live in that world so there's two main copyrights in every song so one is the composition who wrote it and the other is the recording who recorded that song so if you look at a song like, let's say Flowers was 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 listed on our platform, right? And you go, okay, so Flowers was written by uh, Miley Cyrus, Greg uh, Alde, Hein, and uh, Michael Pollack. So there were three songwriters. And then the most famous recording of that composition was, was by Miley Cyrus and owned by her record label, uh, Universal. So on our platform, we would say you can invest in flowers and here's the three songwriters and here's the main recording. And we would say the part of the song that that you're investing is 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 let's this is all by way of example is Michael Pollack's his he was one of the three songwriters and he generates this much money from the song every year. And here's the last few. Flowers is a new song, but if it was a, 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 a an older song, here's the last few years earnings. This is what you get, and all of that. So you so you understand exactly what part of the song you're investing in, because there's lots of parts to a song. There's the recording, there's the songwriters, there's often a producer royalty. So there's a lot of pieces, and we're we're very clear on what exactly the portion you're investing in, and where it's going. And you know, I, I'll just keep saying it over and over again once a song is a hit it always makes money so these are solid earnings <laughs> vehicles like they just generate money over and over of course there's things that can happen to a song bad but there's also things that can happen good but on a macro level once songs are a hit they always earn great so continue that is not investment advice this is just how the industry works Excellent. Let's again, if you listen to the first part of the episode, you know, this is not specific advice. It's like when Eric Henning is on the show to talk money Academy, same thing. This is not specific investment advice. I'll repeat it for Scott. (laughs) This is, we're talking in generalities and examples here, not go out and invest in flowers. So, but, but having said that I, or, and I should say, and instead of, but, but, and I'm going to keep saying, but unfortunately, and (laughs) if my, that's right. Well, but is is removing and and is inclusive. So I, and I try to go for and. Anyway, uh, so Michael Pollack is one third of the writing team of this song, cool. and I, as an investor, go. I want to invest in Michael Pollack's portion of this song. Mm-hmm. Does he have to give me permission? Am I yeah. going? How how does how oh, does all is, of it- You're really, this, this is great because you're really scratching the surface and going one level deeper, which is, is that okay? This is exactly the, the, the direction you should be thinking. So, (laughs) so, so, so on, on the platform itself, songs are listed as if think of it, like each song is its own IPO. It's, it's going to go live on a platform. It's a regulated security. So it's regulated by the SEC, it's an IPO, but it can only IPO if the owner of it 
chooses to IPO it. So -hmm. you can go on our platform now, jkbx.com, and you can see what songs that the rights holders have listed. So, So first and foremost, the rights holder has to list it. So Flowers, yes, may, maybe in this example, uh, Michael, Michael's publisher, if they own it or if he owns it, has listed it, but Miley didn't list her portion, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's depending upon who the rights holder does it. With that said, we won't list a song unless the rights holder has also approved it. So if it's a songwriting credit, we don't need the recording artist to approve it because they're the recording art, but we, but whoever that songwriter was, if they're not cool with this, we won't list it. Even if the rights holder goes, but I want to list it. No, not without the consent of the artist. And the artist doesn't have to grant consent. It's just our own internal belief system that they should, they should, uh, they should feel comfortable with this. Otherwise we're not going to do it. Great. And I appreciate you saying it. And I appreciate that that's part of your business model. Within that, I'm going to keep using Michael Pollack as the example because <laughs> we're talking about him. And Let's, by the way, I don't even know Michael Pollack. So it doesn't, it just, do- this is purely an example. For right, everyone exactly. So he, he I, I guess my thing is, if, if what you say is true, and I have no reason to doubt you that once a song is a hit, it will forever generate income. Then what is Michael Pollack's motivation mm. to list I love his it. Song? I love it. I love you keep going down one level more. So when he lists it, maybe he's taking, let, let's say he doesn't own it. Let's say the publisher owns it because it compositions are typically owned by the publishers. Whoever owns that copyright. One of the things that they that they can do, and it's why you read about these catalog sales from time to time is let's say he's making, we'll just make up a number, a hundred thousand dollars a year for that song. Mm -hmm. And somebody goes, you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, but what if I give you the next 20 years up front? You're like, Oh, so, you know, you go, I'll give you a 20 times multiple of what you already earn. I mean, why does a company IPO? Because they're making money every day, every month, every quarter, every year. It's hard to grow a business when that's your own, you know, you're just on your cash flow. They go, well, what if we take part of the company and sell it to the public? And then we get all that cash in now. What can we do with it now that I have all this cash up front? And so, you know, lots of people go, yeah, I'm making a little every year or every month. But if somebody's willing to to give me all this money up front, so for their perspective, it's like the rights holder. It's like I can take a portion of the income and bring it forward, mm. so that I have that money in my pocket now. So, so that's really the the motivation for the rights holder. Um, but I think there's one other piece to it. You know, there there's some sort of engagement happening. So. Think of it a, a couple of ways. Um, I, I was in New York in, in June and I saw this guy uh, talking from the NFL and he was talking, it was crazy. And I wish I, I wish I could credit him. He was a senior exec. I don't remember his name or his job title, but he was a senior exec at the NFL. And he, came, he, he said something really interesting. He said, fans of football, when a fan of football starts playing fantasy football, their spend on football goes up two to three X a year. So they're already a fan. They watch the NFL on Sundays. They go to a couple of games. Maybe they've, they've bought a Jersey like they're fans of football. But as soon as they start getting engaged with fantasy football, they spend even more on football. And, 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 and we know this with people that own music catalogs. If you do nothing, it makes money. But if you do something like get a sync, meaning getting it in a TV commercial or a film or a, a, a TV series, it makes more money. And it doesn't make more money just because of you get a fee for doing that. But by doing that, <laughs> the song actually streams more. People get more engaged in it. And I think as people start investing in music, their spend on music will go up. 
That's my belief. We haven't proven it out yet. I'm fascinated. I am absolutely fascinated. And I, okay. I, again, I could, I could keep you here pause, for six hours. Pause. Yeah, the, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Yeah, because it's, it is, it's so interesting to me. And I love what you're saying about there is this a supportive quality, right? You are, you are not going to probably invest in a song that doesn't somehow speak to you. And maybe you are, maybe you're going to go, oh, I know this Taylor Swift song is going to make kajillions and it's on the it's on the jukebox catalog and I'm going to go even if I don't like Taylor Swift. But there's I, some I actually think that see actually I I think people understand music and they may invest in a song because they just know that's a good investment. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this artist or that song, but I also know what's good and what's popular and what's successful and I'm not stupid and yeah, I want a piece of that. And, and and that's that's what I'm saying. It's like it, you're saying that this is an alternative asset class, which I love. And maybe someday I'll be able to scroll down my fidelity and go, there's my song that I own a piece of, uh, and which would be really cool. You may think if we're uh, lucky. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for you. Uh, this changes the way we, I mean, this changes the way I'm looking at my own music because my songs have never been hits, of course, but uh, there is this oh, at, at what point can this become viable for someone who isn't Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus or whoever? Like, what is what would be the, I don't even want to say barrier to entry, more where is the breaking point? Where is the point at which Jukebox becomes interested in an artist? How How much of a hit does a song need to be before it's viable for your platform? Well, may, 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 maybe I'll, 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 I'll use the analogy of these uh, songs as IPOs, because that is, they are like mini IPOs. You're bringing it to the market. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there, there's a certain market cap associated with each song. But, but just like, you know, businesses. So for, take it out of music for a second and go, what businesses would IPO? What stage should you be at to IPO? If you have a little shop, a little mom and pop shop, you, I guess you could IPO, but would you want to? There's a lot right. of work that goes behind it. You know, a lot of, you know, regulation and paperwork and things. And then who would be interested in investing in your little mom and pop? Like maybe if, if instead of a mom and pop, you said, oh, I have this large chain store of with 50 locations and we're thinking about IPOing so we can grow it to 2000 locations across the nation. Like you, you want to think about what are the right songs and the right artists to do that. So, so that's where we are today, but that's not where we can be in the future. Mm -hmm. So now maybe you can imagine it where maybe there's a lot of artists that making some money from their songs. So Again, we're not playing on, will this song be a hit? We're saying this song that maybe it was never a hit, but it still earns a couple of thousand a year and it's been doing this for the last 10 years. So it's not huge. So it doesn't make sense to IPO, but maybe we could still bundle it together with a bundle of songs and go, okay, you might not know these songs, but all combined, <laughs> this is what they earn. And, and think of it like a fund. So, mm. so, so that way, a musician that has some music that, that makes some money, they're like, eh, it makes dribs and drabs every year, but how do I cash out some of it and bring some of that money forward? Because on my own, maybe it's not so interesting, but if I combine it with everything else, you know, I'll, I'll give an, an example. And it's in some ways, it's a terrible example. And I, I, I even hate to use it, but I'll say it out <laughs> loud, do not cringe. Mortgage-backed securities. Okay. Yes, there was a <laughs> film on it. Yes, it crashed our economy, but there was also some fraud involved in that. So, But the concept works. The concept works that banks <laughs> issue mortgages, and after they issue a lot of them, they bundle them together and sell them off as a, as a package. Now, forget about what happened with the rating of the bonds and all of that stuff. The notion works, you package them together, and then somebody that's going to buy that bundle of mortgages, 
because when you buy them as a bundle, it also de-risks them because you go, what's the average default rate on these? Oh, well, 10% of these mortgages default. And what's the average mortgage interest rate? Okay, what's the average there? And, and what's the average term left on these mortgages? Is it five years or is it 40 years still left? Like, so they look at it as a, as a bundle and go, this is a solid investment, right? So you could look at it like music that way, where if you go, look, putting all these songs together, they generate collectively $2 million a year. And, you know, if you bought in, this would be the, the, the average yield you would expect, like the interest you could make on it. So you do those kinds of ways of looking at it. You can look and see what's in there, but you might not recognize the name of the artist or the name of the, uh, of the song. But guess what? If you looked into the bundle of rights of mortgage, you know, uh, 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 the, the mortgages, nobody's asking the question of like, what color did they paint the front door? Like, what? That, that's not the question we're asking. So this is a way that, that smaller artists that have a catalog of songs that generate money can make money. It's not going to make them more famous. It's not going to make them anything. But what it's doing is saying, this is how you, you, you're generating income and we can leverage it. Because maybe if you're making, you know, a thousand bucks a year on all these songs. You're like, you know what? If somebody's going to give me some multiple of that now, I'd rather take, you know, 15 times multiple and take $15,000 now than wait 15 years to get $15,000. Does that make sense to you? It does. It's interesting because I, it seems to me a little bit like winning the lottery, right? They offer you this, you can take, essentially 40% right. of, of the $200 million that you won. So you get $80 million now, or you can get 150, but over the next 20 years. And so the smart money tends to be take the 80 million now and, and don't wait the 15 years because the money is then yours to invest or to do whatever you want to do with right More away. More importantly, it, there's, there's a term, again, I, my, my background, my, my degrees in psychology, not finance, but um, you know, it's it's called net present value of money, so the 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 MPV, and saying having having a million dollars today is worth more than fifty thousand dollars a year for twenty years, because the the value of that fifty thousand dollars in year sixteen is not the same value as it is today. So if you had it now, how could you use it and deploy it? Um, so it's it, it's typically better to take the money when you can get it. Sure. For for all sorts of reasons. I I, I concur wholeheartedly <laughs> and I don't have a finance background at all. So but at the same time, when I'm in this position of going, OK, I, I I'm going to put myself in the role of the artist. I have this catalog. It's making me some money. I'm going to put it out on jukebox and then bad things happen. I, I, I get canceled. I don't know, whatever it is. And my songs tank and they make no one money. There has to be a thing with the SEC where it's, it, it is like stocks. It is sort of like buying that, that I I'm going to invest and hope that it does well. And I'm going yeah. to invest carefully and all of that, but there are dangers. You might lose all your money. If you invested $50 you, or whatever, that might just happen. You absolutely hit it. And, 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 and you know this is what we're doing with regulated securities, and we put in all the risk factors, you know, because that is it. Yes, you get canceled, and your song gets pulled off all the services, or there's a copyright dispute, and you lose because for some reason, or uh, I don't know, uh, the the copyright expires and it goes into the public domain. You know, there's risk factors associated with that, but there's risk factors associated with any business that IPOs. And so you're, it's, it's about managing that risk. Um, and, and so that's why also putting them into a fund is one way that mitigates risk for the, for the uh, retail investor. But, but, you know, there's always risk. There's always risk. Sure. And it's almost like a, like a social, uh, like a, an index fund. What I'm thinking of is when you're talking about investing in a catalog yeah. of some will do better, some will do worse, but you're on the whole, you're hoping that it will rise just like the stock market on the whole rises over time. Yeah. I think, I think, I think 
uh, Goldman Sachs pegged the growth of the music industry to be steady at six to eight percent a year over the next decade. I mean, that is massive. So do nothing and it grows six to eight percent a year with organic growth. So that the music industry, that's that's pretty phenomenal if that if that holds true. Wow. That um, that actually is really good growth. I did not have any idea that yeah, that would yeah. be the case. I, I would like to pivot just a little bit and ask you about a different sort of song, if you will, because it's got a, a unique, it's going, this song is going on a unique or has gone on a, on a unique adventure. And that is Tracy Chapman's Fast Car. And so there's this, I, I mean, and I was around when the original album came out and sat on the floor of, of my friend's apartment and we listened to the album nonstop. It's a great album, et cetera, et cetera. Fast Car is a terrific song. And 35 years later, Luke Combs records it and now it's a number one hit. And now it's also a number one hit again for Tracy Chapman because yep. of all of the sort of information. So someone wants to invest in Fast Car. Whose fast car do they invest in? Do they invest in Tracy Chapman's fast car? Do they invest in Luke Combs' fast car? Do they invest in Tracy Chapman having written fast car? How does that work with respect to ju providing, of course, fast cars on jukebox, et cetera, et cetera? Well, well, How would well, that work? The, yeah, that, that, that's the point. It's did any one of those rights holders make their rights you know, available? Did they, mm -hmm. did any of those, not their rights available, the income. So did any of them list on the jukebox platform. If if one did, you might only, you have no choice. It's, oh, I can only get this version or that version or this songwriter. But if there's multiple, like what if both master recordings were up, Luke Combs version and Tracy Chapman's version, then you can choose which one you think is a better investment um, or, or choose both. Um, but, but that, 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 how do I, that's the fun part about it, you know, because, because I think, you know, how do I, I'm always, I'm always concerned about what I say with SEC regulations, but, but I do think it's the fun part about it because, you know, investing shouldn't be this kind of stuffy old thing that, you know, your parents or grandparents did. Why can't it be, why can't you build wealth and understand the financial markets, but still be fun? Like, why does fun not take part in all of this you ask a good question especially if someone who <laughs> mm -hmm. as i said at do not i do not have a finance background uh and it is it is i find it daunting i have to say so maybe doing something like investing in music would be very because i am a musician it would be something that i would have some familiarity with and that would be a cool way to do it i uh, I'm very looking forward to seeing how Jukebox goes and, and what happens. Before we go, because again, Scott, honestly, I could talk to you for the next six <laughs> hours. Uh, I would love to ask you a few, a couple last questions before I know you have to take off and go do the rest of your day. What does success with Jukebox look like for you? What, if you were going to look in the, in the crystal ball and tell me this is what success looks like, what does that look like for you? What will make you feel like, ah, and perhaps I'm ready to go on to my next adventure because I've done uh, everything I can do with this one. Yeah, I, th I think su success takes on many forms. Um, certainly that, that we hold up to our ideals that that all the the participants in the ecosystem benefit from it. Mm. So so that the fans and the retail investors benefit, the songwriters and the recording artists benefit, the rights holders of those copyrights benefit, the financial markets benefit. Like that to me is is one piece of success. The other is that that people actually start doing this and learning about Th those people that maybe weren't in this space start learning about investing and that it's not a scary thing and you can give it a try. I think success looks like another way of demonstrating the value of music because if we get it right, again, about not being disruptive, we're going to hopefully add billions of dollars on top of the existing music ecosystem and that what we call investing in music as an alternative asset class today is so normalized that, the, the, again, taking it back to my roots at the orchard, 
what seemed like crazy and experimental stuff about downloading music over the world wide web onto your computer, <laughs> you know, like that sounded groundbreaking. And now we're doing this podcast over the web. I'm in a different country than you. I'm, I'm sitting in, in London. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. we, we, all of this stuff is just so normalized that, that, People today, there's an expectation that if I want to write and record a song, I can just do it wherever I am in my bedroom, in my living room. Like, what do you mean you don't have to book out a studio, pay tens of, tens of thousands of dollars, have an engineer, a producer, and a record label that's going to pay for it? No, I can just do it on my own because I'm being creative. And then I'd like to release it to the world. Okay, you can do that with a press of a button. Oh, and I'd like to do marketing and promotion. You can do that. And it's everything that seemed absolutely crazy 25 years ago is so normalized that people can't even imagine that it was another way. And so I'd love, you know, the definition of success for jukeboxes. It's so normalized. People think, isn't this how we always did it? Mm. Oh, really? Oh, you couldn't just buy shares in songs? No, you couldn't. Oh, wow. What did that world look like? Um, and so that to me is, is the ultimate success. And mic drop. I love it. I love it, Scott. Thank you so much. This this is such a, a delightful conversation. And as I said, six hours easily. I have got because I have more questions. So maybe <laughs> maybe down the road a little bit, you'll come on back and we'll we'll discuss even more about how this works. Because I as oh, I said, come on anytime, <laughs> anytime. You name oh, it. that's fabulous. I love to hear that. I have just a couple more questions uh, for you. First of all, if somebody wants to know more about Jukebox, how would they find it? Where is Jukebox out on the interwebs, as they say? Yeah, the, the, the simplest way is to go to, to the website. So we pronounce it Jukebox, but it's spelled J-K-B-X. So think like a, you know, a stock ticker symbol. So jkbx.com, and you can see everything you need right there. Awesome. And and when you have your IPO for Jukebox, I imagine those will uh, actually be the stock ticker symbol for it. <laughs> I hope so. We should see if there's a way to reserve it. Yeah. Oh, I know. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, really. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm coughing. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Uh oh. She's oh. I thought we were finished with COVID, but apparently you're still coughing. Oh, uh, no, it's I'm I'm not coughing because I have s severe scent allergies and my neighbors, unfortunately, like to smoke a lot of pot. So uh, when they're smoking a lot of pot, I it comes down into my apartment and this is my life anyway. But we are not talking about that right now. So thank you so do much you, for the. Do you, go ahead. you get a contact buzz from that? Do you get a little bit high from your neighbor smoking? I, so yes, I don't even. Cough. <laughs> but no, it's not worth it. No, uh, unfortunately, I don't. It's just I just uh, it's bad <laughs> enough that I'll it, I will pass out and not at all in a good way from having partied too much. I just, I just uh, constricts my breathing anyway. Oof, oof. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, it's, and it's weird to be a, a professional musician when you're gigging, you're playing out. And of oh. course you're playing out in places where people are doing a lot of, so I have to be very, very careful when I play out because uh, I can, I can pass out pretty easily if somebody's smoking or even wearing perfume anywhere near me. So wow. it's a, but imagine, yeah. remember those days when actually people were in bars oh. smoking. Oh. Yeah. I, well, I went to Ireland twice in a couple of years in the early aughts and first year people were still smoking in pubs. Wow. The next year, it was the first year that they had out loud smoking in pubs. The war, it was an entirely different world for me. Yeah, I was it was yeah. amazing. So yeah, I uh, that's I bring my fiddle to Ireland and I play in sessions. And now I actually can bring my fiddle <laughs> and play in sessions because no one's smoking inside the pubs. Anyway, again, I I'm super grateful that you took the time to to chat with me today because this is this is a co really cool and fascinating way of looking at music and at supporting music artists so i'm grateful to you for doing this and i'm grateful grateful to you i remember orchard so I, i'm grateful to yeah. you for for orchard as well i have just one last question and sure. it's a question that i ask everybody who comes on the show and it's a strange little question but i find it can yield some profound answers and here it is if you had an airplane environmentally friendly of course that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see what would you say? 
compassion. Just have compassion. If I weren't already married, I'd be asking you to marry me right now. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scott, thank you so much. That That's, yeah, that's great. Uh, somebody asked me, Isolde, what would you say? And mine was easy. Be kind. That was... Uh, <laughs> similar. You know, I have to say, and I know that was the last question, and then you can wrap it up. And even if you want to edit me out, you can edit me out. But, but you know, because you're a vegan and I'm a vegan, and, and I kind of look at it, you know, it's... It, uh, sometimes through the lens of compassion, meaning it's quite a binary um, emotion or feeling that you either are compassionate or not. You don't mm -hmm. get to pick and choose your compassion. Mm -hmm. I'm compassionate to my dog, but this cow, no. I'm compassionate to my neighbor, but they live in a different country and they're my enemies and I'm not compassionate towards them and we're at war or they're immigrants or this, like, I don't buy it. You're either compassionate or you're not. And I think people need to think about that hard to be a little more compassionate. No, to be a lot more compassionate. It's not It's not something you pick and choose. I would never edit that out. In fact, I might, I might put that at the very front of the episode like uh -huh. I usually do. That was wonderful, brilliant, and, uh, and as I figured, profound. Scott, Thank you again so much for being on the show. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I can't wait till the next time you're back. I have another litany of questions for you. Looking ready, <laughs> looking forward to round two. <laughs> awesome. All this right. is thank you, Scott. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Solutions Podcast. Get to know Jukebox more. Get to know Scott Cohen more. You know what to do. If you want to follow the show, if you want to subscribe to the show, if you want to refer friends, musicians, neighbors random people off the street to be on the show you know how to find me podcast.isoldat.com this is the creative solutions podcast i am your host isolda trachtenberg and as always i remind you to be bold be creative and most of all be kind <music>